on the Talkback Show, on the radio, or whatever audiovisual device you choose to use. Welcome to the GBC Podcast, where we talk about the Packers and our hometown of Green Bay. This is episode 28, created on November 9th, 2022. I'm John. I'm in Appleton, Wisconsin. Along with me are Jeff, who is in Green Bay this week, and Neil on the East Coast. Say hello, gentlemen, and tell us what you're drinking. Hello, Jerry. <laughs> I'm drinking, indeed, a Hello, Jerry with the nice U.S. Postal Service from Burley Oaks Brewing. It is a double IPA. I'm uh, having from Oliphant Brewing a medium talent Imperial Stout. All right, and I'm still on a health kick with vitamin C. I've got a Malibu <laughs> and pineapple juice tonight. All right. All right, you can find us on YouTube and Twitter at Green Bay Chat and Facebook at the GBC Podcast, Green Bay Chat. And just the audio is available on Spotify and Anchor by searching for Green Bay Chat. Here's what we're taking a look at this week. We'll start off with the debacle in Detroit. We're going to talk about the Salute to Service Month with the NFL. We have our Packer Player of the Past. Of course, we'll be talking about Week 10, the Dallas game, and whoever that head coach of theirs is coming into town, and our Packer history report as well. Uh, but for right now, you guys, uh, what exactly happened uh, in Detroit there? Jeff, are we alive yet? Uh, will, this team, I guess... will this team ever win another game, Jeff? Well, I think inevitably they'll just they'll get lucky. They'll have to win one more game, right? But they don't have to. Well, I mean, what didn't happen in Detroit, right? I mean, you know, I'm sure Neil Neil will get into this, but pretty much we won every statistical category again, right? We except dominated for the one that counts, <laughs> except the freaking one that counts. Exactly <laughs> that whole you know that more points at the end of the game thing seems to be very nebulous right now and hard to achieve. So nine flipping points, seriously, 389 yards, 69 plays, nine points. Come on. The Packers were allergic to the end zone. I mean, that, that is the only explanation I have. There was just a whole bunch of, I don't know if it was peanut butter, every allergen known to man. And they put that on the end zone. We were absolutely allergic to the end zone because I don't know how you explain how we can be as close to the end zone as many times as we were and not, score more points than we did just a reminder detroit this year their defense has not allowed fewer than 24 points all season <laughs> until sunday this is the first time they've allowed fewer than 29 points and again they allowed 389 yards we could have and should have scored a lot more points yeah we were inside detroit's 25 yard line six times we scored on two of those two times out of six within detroit's 25 and fundamentally, that's the story of the game. I rewatched the game you know, again this week and just punching I, 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 yourself in the nuts. Again, honestly, dude. honestly, honestly, I came out of the rewatch, though, actually feeling better about the team because our offense looked good almost the entire game. If you exclude our final plays on each drive. Big exclusion, to be fair. But well, and, if those, you, and those three interceptions, too. Well, yeah, those, 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 those would have really been the well final plays of the team, drive. Yes. But but fundamentally, <laughs> we moved the ball well. Yeah. We moved the ball, pa ball, well, ball well passing. We moved the ball okay running when we tried to run, although not great. Um, mm -hmm. Rodgers had a couple of long runs, though. Our defense did reasonably against them after their first drive, and except for Detroit's final drive, both of which were problematic. But we just couldn't do that last final component. And it's remarkable that we're in this situation of losing to Detroit, playing as well as we did objectively. And it's not that Rodgers played a bad game throughout. He had some bad passes in the context of a lot of really good plays as far as that game is concerned. And I guess that is the biggest thing I got off the rewatch is that our offensive line looked better than I remembered it being. Rodgers looked better than I remembered him being. He was being. only sacked once, right? He was only sacked once. And, you know, there was a pretty big sack at midfield that led to our only punt. But going back to that, we punted one time. We punted once in that entire game. You punt once in a game, you should certainly have a good number of points as the game is concerned you certainly shouldn't no. be stuck at nine i mean i it, 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 i mean <laughs> and all of the all of the interceptions were within detroit's two yard line yeah right three so, interceptions inside of detroit's two yeah and, I mean, I, and then just stopping with that what about that last drive 
We got down to Detroit 17. We had 55 seconds and two timeouts left. We had plenty of time to move the ball and do what we want to do. We had two throwaway passes, one contested pass, and one pass in which, you know, it was a fade to the corner of the end zone. We did nothing as far as using the center of the field when we had 55 seconds left, two timeouts, and only needed to go 17 yards to score a touchdown. That last four plays was absolutely appalling. And that's what, after the game, certainly what drove me crazy the most. And it's, it's even more remarkable when you look at it. Again, I mean, how can you explain what we did on those final four plays? Well, not only that, but a touchdown in the extra point wins the game. It's not like it would have forced overtime. It's not like we would have needed another possession to score more points or whatever. Score a touchdown, win the fucking game. That's all that had to be done. And they couldn't, and they were close. But it, So this is another one of those, they're getting really creative now in finding ways to lose games, right? Because I mean, you know, we've had some ass hats, we've had some defensive breakdowns, we've but now it's like, okay, how are they gonna manufacture something, some stupid shit to come up with to lose the game? Throw so, the Bakhtiari in fourth down. That's how you manufacture stupid shit. <laughs> right. So again, that's not simplifying, is it? No, just something, just how can they? Yeah. So I don't yes, there are again silver linings here but they're still losing football games. Now the schedule, so we, we've had, you know, we've played some teams that, okay, we thought we should have beat certainly at the beginning of the year. So now really good teams are coming, are coming on the schedule. So now what the hell happens? Well, you, you play the game as their schedule first. <laughs> and, and I think we knew all along that this Dallas, Tennessee uh, thing back to back this week was going to be a tricky one. Fortunately, they're both home games. Uh, then they get a good break through Thanksgiving before heading over to Philadelphia. Uh, but yeah, you just got to take them one day, one game at a time, you know, and throw those cliches out there and let's, let's take a look at Dallas, but <laughs> this team is so wounded. I don't even That's know the other who's thing gonna, too. who's going to play. We, yeah. Uh, I mean, and before we even get into that Dallas game, let's, let's, you talked about the silver lining, Jeff. Let's look at one of the big bright spots was the Jair Alexander interception where we finally make a play on a crossing pattern and, <laughs> and i almost feel like jair took that upon himself to say fuck this shit i'm getting a ball because i'm not gonna go you know i'm not gonna leave this soft guy open underneath yeah you just you just wonder so i was looking at so he's actually so he was injured for well, almost two games so i mean roughly seven games played he's had nine passes defensed now, what was the number of passes defense through like the what the first sec you know two three four weeks that we talked about earlier? It wasn't well, it, very many. It, yeah, it was like it was like three or something like that. Yeah. Right? So he has nine passes defensed right now. Um, you know, so that's encouraged. So again, encouraging. But they are they lose arguably one of their best defenders in Rashawn Gary. I mean, that's that's a huge, huge loss. But with Gary down and Campbell down too, that that's yeah. You know, we're going to get some rotation in there. Um, but Quay Walker is certainly stepping up and, and playing up to his first round expectations. Yeah, uh, I'd like thankfully. to see maybe Devontae Wyatt get out there and, and do a little bit more. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you've got a young defense that um, if they can play strong, uh, they'll, they'll hold their own. And that's all we've needed them to do this year. Yeah. And I think for the most part, I mean, they held Detroit to 15 points. That's still pretty good. Yeah. And only 254 yards as well. They, yeah. Detroit essentially had two really good drives. Timing wise, the first one of the game wasn't great. And thankfully, they decided to leave Rashawn Gary unblocked on the uh, yeah. fourth down from the five <laughs> yard line. But um, and so, so there was some luck as far as that's concerned, but we'll, we'll take that. But, you know, if you have a 135 yard advantage in yards, you should win the game. I mean, it's right. just we, we had a good offense. We had a good defense overall. Everything was good except for our inability to score in Detroit's scoring zone. Going back to those injuries, though, and, and talking about Rashawn Gary, th that injury, the play looks so benign. And, and the players are, are really coming out against that turf material yeah. in Detroit this week. Now, I don't know that anybody actually plays on real grass. I know Soldier Field, they just had to replace that real grass. Green Bay's grass is a hybrid. 
and it has the the synthetic and the rubber material in it, but that that forward field is still concrete and indoor outdoor carpeting is what it comes down to. But you watch yeah. him, you know, he's he's pursuing one way, realize he's got to go back the other way. He plants and turns, and it and just that. it Put like a spring. The, it just yeah. was gone. It's just so benign looking. It doesn't. It looks harmless, just like the Nick Collins neck injury looked like nothing. The 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 Bo Jackson hip injury looked like nothing, and it's unreal the damage that 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 these guys have. I mean, that's how ACL injuries basically always look, though, right? I mean, when you see somebody basically get get injured when nothing else is going on, your first thought is, well, that's got to be an ACL injury. And the Packers now have three ACL injuries on that synthetic turf in the last you know two and a half years or so. And that's really what the Packers players were going on about. And I, I can't say that uh, if, if there's a perception among the players that it's a problem, it seems to me that it's a problem. Well, and there was, I hate to uh, agree with Pete Carroll, but a few weeks back, he came out pretty strongly as well, um, saying that these stadiums with, you know, what used to be called AstroTurf and whatever the hell it's called, a field turf or whatever that high, you know, it's, it's still causing injuries. I mean, it's, it's softer than it used to be. You know, it's not like playing on a, on a parking lot, but um, you know, it's still, it still seems to be causing injuries and that's, it'll be interesting to see, you know, as with the NFL is a billion dollar industry, you know, are they gonna, are they gonna fix that? You know, it seems like a reasonably simple thing to do. Um, but, you know, I don't know, stay tuned. So do you want to talk about um, the player that the Packers picked up off the waiver wire just a few hours ago? Did you guys see that? The the Raiders player? A, yeah. worse, ver a worse version of Darnell Savage is what I saw. <laughs> uh, that's reasonably accurate yeah first round pick um from so in theory it will help out with stokes being down um you know so they moved some players around so in theory uh the guy they picked up is jonathan abram and um so i took down some stats so i i mean i think they're gonna plug him in if nothing else perhaps on special teams so he's got uh three career interceptions 255 tackles 11 passes defensed, as I mentioned earlier, that Jair Alexander has nine in like seven games. And right. he's I mean, got he NFL for three and a half years. That's pretty yeah. pitiful as far as the statistics are concerned. Well, and here's here's the statistic that 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 I thought was most interesting. According to NFL next gen stats, of the 121 players who have logged at least 1,000 coverage snaps since 2019. He's allowed the second highest completion percentage as the nearest defender. Oh, he'll fit right in. <laughs> but I mean, so gotta, again, maybe in special a, teams. I, I don't know. Who is a first round pick? You still have to at least take a flyer on him. I mean, you've got to throw as much as you can against the wall right now to see what's going to stick. Yeah. Right. And and I think you mentioned the special teams, right? So he's played with Rich Passacci. And so. Sorry, the assets. He's played at least with Rich Bisaccia, so he true, knows yes. what he is looking. Mm -hmm. He's he knows what contributions that that uh, he can make. So I think there's something to be said for that. And yes, I, I don't. I'm not opposed to picking somebody who's first round talent off the waiver wire. We obviously have some holes to fill due to injuries, yeah. with especially with Stokes now. We'll see if it works out. It certainly doesn't cost us any money. We've got plenty a rookie of contract. Yeah. We've got plenty of salary cap space as well. So. Um, no big deal as far as whether it does whether it works out or it doesn't but um it's not <laughs> it's not it's not changing it's not changing the needle as far as anything is concerned and it's not a receiver so i mean you could you know we could go into this but you know are they it's so it's another defensive guy so hopefully you know the receivers heal a little bit and um but it's still not a receiver and and with this record you know, I don't think we're looking at uh, Odell Beckham anymore or really anybody else. I think, you know, as Rogers said after the trading deadline last week, we have who we have now. And with this recent rash of, rash of injuries, stay tuned. But it, I don't think it's going to be pretty. A lot of interesting information coming out on the Christian Watson injury as well, that it was not a concussion in Detroit, uh, but rather a chest injury. But he was listed as being in the, concuss in the concussion protocol on the injury report, but he is going to be ready to play on Sunday. Well, same with Aaron Jones, right? Aaron Jones could have gone back in and they 
went with an abundance of caution in the end. And uh, Aaron Jones was underplayed as far as that game was concerned. He only had nine rushes for 25 yards. Um, you know, halfway through the second quarter, he was only, only hit his fourth rush of the game. Yeah. So we didn't take full advantage of Aaron Jones. And especially when we got down to that first and what should have been one centimeter to go. And we did four straight plays, none of which involved Aaron Jones. Um, yeah, we got it. We had to make sure that we don't forget the lesson that we got in Buffalo and that we should have gotten last year and the year before that give the damn ball to Aaron Jones. He's really, really good. I think, I think eventually, you, you know, we're going to have a running game by default if there are no receivers out there to catch the ball you know Rodgers can audible mm. out or, or choose the pass play as much as he wants but if there's no one to catch I mean he's he's eventually got to go to the running game and I think that once there is a full commitment and I think he probably is the one person who needs to be convinced that we have to commit to the run and once that team commits to the run I think we're going to see a lot stronger offense and a lot more points being scored one thing that was different about the passing game in Detroit, though, is that prior to the Detroit game, the Packers actually led the NFL in passes behind the line of scrimmage. Um, whereas in the Lions game, we had only a very small number of passes behind the line of scrimmage. We played the middle of the field a lot more against Detroit than we did in prior games. And I would say that is encouraging. Now, is that encouraging just because Detroit's defense is terrible? We'll find out. And, and <laughs> Dallas's defense is going to be a pretty good way to find that out. But at least we are not just throwing these very short passes behind the line of scrimmage that don't have a lot of chance of success. My other big positive of the game is just looking at that first half. We had 205 yards in the first half. We did not punt once. We were six of eight on third downs. Our drives broadly looked really good, except for how they ended, as I said. And I just, I, I, I actually am encouraged with the progression in the offense and hopes that it hope. I just hope that it's not a Detroit mirage. Now we'll talk at length about the Dallas game in a little bit. And before we really move on with the program, we, we have to kind of make fun of our own folly. We've got a picture up here again, going back to our Buffalo trip. And we totally forgot to mention Dave last week, our friend Dave, who now who grew up with us in green Bay, went to high school with us now lives in Baltimore, joined us on this trip to to Buffalo. Neil, you and Dave came over from the East Coast. Uh, so we really appreciated Dave's presence there. He had a great time uh, and he's in the picture there. And yeah, just uh, we need to acknowledge Dave. We looked back last week and we're like, oh, whoops. We you didn't know, mention we, him last week. We said his name in passing. Yeah, but when we we're, we're not actually acknowledging work. and, and yeah. things like that. So yeah, so Dave, thanks, thanks for coming out with us. Um, again, hope you had fun. Uh, you survived uh, Bill's Mafia at, at, and uh, certainly were, uh, were a great addition. Um, great addition he, he, with us. He certainly was in the social media because we did post the videos. The video of him yep. doing the bowling ball shot is in there. He's in a lot of the pictures. So we didn't forget about him completely. We just didn't mention him last right. week. So we're give, give credit where credit is due here. And, and thanks again for, uh, for coming out, Dave. The other thing about Dave is that he used to live in upstate New York. He was at, lived in Rochester for a few years. And so he knows that area reasonably well. And on the drive back from Buffalo last week, we stopped at the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, it is a remarkably good museum. It's actually one of the favorite um, science slash art slash history museums because it covers all of those elements as far as glass is concerned. Um, you know, what were involved as far as developments of glass, how is it used artistically, they had demonstrations of glass blowing, as well as a huge display of, of glass in human history. And uh, that's one of the favorite finds I've had as far as a museum in recent times. So thank you, Dave, for going there. And if you're anywhere near Corning, New York, I strongly recommend the Corning Museum of Glass. Yet, yet you also totally bypassed the Jello Museum in Leroy, New York, which is also a cute little museum as well. Yeah, it, the Corning Museum of Glass is much more than just cute. <laughs> well, the month of November is the salute to service in the NFL because Friday, November 11th, is Veterans Day. Probably the greatest analogy of the game of professional football to the military comes from our favorite, George Carlin, who said, in football, the object is for the quarterback, also known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy in spite of the blitz even if he has to use the shotgun with short bullet passes and long bombs he marches his troops into enemy territory 
balancing this aerial assault with a sustained ground attack that punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line and the great uh, football versus baseball routine. And it's a great analogy. <laughs> it is exactly <laughs> correct. I can see Neil. Neil likes to laugh without making noise. So if you're watching the video, you certainly can see Neil with a big smile there. Of course, uh, but it is. why would I not be smiling? <laughs> Uh, but with, with the NFL doing our salute to service, I would like to salute my two uh, co-hosts here. Jeff, your dad served in the United States Army during the Korean War. He was on active duty, but uh, fortunately stayed stateside and, and is a veteran of the Korean War. Neil, your dad uh, served his two years in the United States Army and, uh, and, and got to be at Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, which is lovely. So I think Fort Knox, Jeff, is a slight uh, advantage over Fort Leonard Wood. Uh, but uh, your dad didn't really talk about it much either. I didn't find out no. about it until he until his retirement party. I was floored once he started talking about serving in Korea or during yeah. Korea. Yeah, he he was very um, yeah he he didn't share much of it. Um, I don't think it was a bad experience for him. He just didn't really talk about it. It was uh, you know he was pretty young kid when he went down there, um, and so. You know, I think it was really his his first time away from home, frankly. And um, so, you know, I think he, he was forced to grow up. Um, I know he was, you know, from a culture shock being from, you know, coming down from Green Bay, going into uh, basically, you know, another world almost, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, not that far. It's still the United States. Obviously, it wasn't Korea, but um still a, a certainly a different part of the world that he had not been in. So when he passed a few years ago, uh, as a uh, retired uh, service member, we were uh, able to get a uh, flag. So that's what I, I have in the background here. Um, so his flag uh, that we received. So that's that was that was a great uh, memento uh, for him. But yeah, he just he didn't talk about it a lot. But he just he he proudly served. So I would like to thank both my father-in-law and my godfather who did serve and served in Vietnam. My father-in-law served in the army during the time of Vietnam um, and was subjected to Agent Orange during his time when he was in Vietnam. Um, he was eventually recognized for disability due to cancer that developed due to Agent Orange exposure. My uncle Jeff also served in Vietnam and was subject to a Viet Cong assault um, that left mo most of his entire platoon killed. Uh, he basically survived because he looked like he was killed. Um, and thankfully, he was one of a small number who survived from his platoon. Um, so both of them served admirably in Vietnam. And both of them are very proud of their service throughout their entire life. Neil, I had a great conversation with your dad uh, just before we left for Canada. And uh, he, he, again, does, didn't wear his service on his sleeve. But you know, he was in, in Missouri for two years, uh, and as a doctor, he, I think, accepted the, the military's offer to pay for some schooling, and he said he, he begged them. He said, send me somewhere, send me somewhere interesting. He really wanted to go to Alaska. He wanted to be stationed in Alaska for two years, uh, but instead they sent him to, to Bumfuck, Missouri, which is <laughs> literally right in the middle of nowhere. It's, you know, Fort Leonard Wood is, is South Central Missouri, right in the middle of the Mark Twain National Forest. That's why it is affectionately called Fort Lost in the Woods uh, from time to time. And that's where I went for my basic training. Uh, and I served there during uh, Operation Desert Storm. I was on active duty. I fortunately as well stayed stateside uh, and spent six months again in Missouri. It's not a terrible place, uh, but it's, you know, if, if you want to go to fun, exotic locations where you can be stationed in a military base, like I said, you could probably find some better locations as well. <laughs> That ain't it. So. And one more salute to service to our friend Dave that we just mentioned who went on the road yes. trip with, with us. And he also was in the reserves and then was uh, changed to active duty during Desert Storm and served in Germany because he was working in, um, in hospital units as far as collecting blood and preparing for uh, any danger that would occur to troops that would be evacuated from Kuwait and Iraq. Yeah, and Dave was a, a medic. Uh, one other I'll throw out there as well, my father-in-law too, Neil Ralph, uh, served during Vietnam. He's also been very active uh, since then. He uh, is very involved with the, um, uh, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the VFW. He was at one time the state commander of the VFW here in Wisconsin. And we recently had a, a nice presentation for him at the VFW in his hometown. Uh, where they, the, the ladies auxiliary and the honor guard uh, did a whole presentation for him uh, that, that kind of an honor that not a lot of the, the, the veterans get. Uh, 
And sometimes the, these honors that they get is after they've passed. And so fortunately he was able to, to enjoy it. So we had a good day with him uh, there as well. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, my, my father-in-law also served in his local VFW post, didn't rise to state level or anything like that, but he, he served very proudly in his local VFW post, uh, including serving as president of his local VFW post. And when he passed, um, having the entire VFW show up for his funeral, having you know the, the military with TAPS components to his funeral and to his burial was especially meaningful. And uh, I, I definitely, I mean, it was obviously a, a sad day overall, but I was really especially proud of his service because of all of the fellow soldiers who were saluting him during his uh, funeral and burial. And we certainly do appreciate uh, the NFL uh, and the Green Bay Packers for their continued support of the American military, uh, that they show it in their salute to service. And, and I can say for sure one thing that, that is always exciting in Green Bay is the, the flyover during the national anthem. And it is, a, it is an event that is not just for those at Lambeau Field, because of the way Green Bay is laid out, <laughs> you can witness that flyover from just about anywhere. In fact, on our social media page, uh, one of our reels on Instagram, uh, easily our most popular is one that I took of the flyover of the four jets uh, flying over Lambeau Field uh, for the national anthem. There have also been numerous players in the National Football League who have served in the military before, during, and after their football careers. And to talk about one of those in our Packer player of the past is Neil. Canadeo, Canadeo, oh, 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 Canadeo, Canadeo, to Tony Canadeo, Canadeo, to Tony Canadeo, rock me Canadeo. Our Packers nice. player of the past is Tony Canadeo. Um, really? And uh, this is the person uh, I, I've mentioned previously that I think we should have chants for NFL stadiums, NFL games. Um, the nature of the chant is that you take a very popular song that everyone knows and then com completely mutilate the words to apply to your teams or to your favorite players. Rock me Canadeo. So Tony Canadeo was a star for the Green Bay Packers in the 1940s, um, starting from 1942 and playing until 1952. Um, he was born in 1919, a very perfect year for a Packers player to be born in. Grew up in Chicago, um, played high school football. He was Italian, um, in the Italian local Hall of Fame as far as his play is concerned, but then went out to Gonzaga University. Now, you might think of Gonzaga as a basketball school, but at that time, they were also a football team, a football powerhouse as well. He was the great ghost of Gonzaga. He was a relentless player, played on those teams, played all sorts of positions, and at the end of the 1940. Gonzaga season, he went into the NFL draft. Um, Gonzaga actually dropped their football program after the following year. So he's the last Gonzaga player to play in the NFL. Tony Canadeo, as a player, was a jack of all trades. He was a not a large player, but he was an absolutely relentless player based on reports at the time. He played halfback for the Packers. He played quarterback. He played safety. He played punter. He did punt returns. He did kick returns. Essentially, whatever job you need to do, that's what Tony Canadeo did. Um, in his rookie year, he did not play a lot, as rookies tend not to do, uh, but he did throw quarterback, and he did uh, run as a running back. Um, so he had three touchdowns uh, running, two touchdowns passing in his rookie year. In his sophomore season, uh, 1942, he started to make larger contributions to the team um, as he started to replace Clark Hinkle and Cecil Isbell, who had been the stars of the team up until that point. His breakthrough season for the Packers was the 1943 season. He had 875 yards passing with nine touchdowns. He rushed for 489 yards. He had two receiving touchdowns along with his three rushing touchdowns. He had 14 total touchdown involvements during that 1943 season. For that, he was named first team all pro. And again, he was not just being a runner or a kicker or receiver. He also was the primary punter at the time. He played safety for the Packers at the time. And so an absolute all around beast for that 1943 Packers team. But you'll note the 1943 was during World War II. And so at the end of the 1943 season, he enlisted within the army. And in that 1944 season that followed, he only played three games for the Packers, all during furlough from the Army. So you'll re recall that 1944 is one of the Packers NFL championship years. Well, Tony Canadeo has a ring for that championship, um, but he actually only played three games for the Packers, um, 149 yards rushing, 89 yards passing. 
Um, he was somebody who was dedicated to his country, dedicated to the service of his country. Um, and so he essentially missed that year that ended up being the Packers' last championship in the Don Hudson era. 1945, he served in the Army and did not play in the NFL at all. So his top year in the NFL, 1943, 14 touchdowns. He goes immediately to the Army at the peak of his career as a matter of choice, not because he was drafted. World War II ends, he returned to the Packers and basically mostly played running back from that point on from 1946 to 1952. Um, he missed one game over that entire time time um, in 1946. So he was an early Packers Ironman. Uh, he was the leading Packers rusher for most of those years. In 1949, he set a Packers record as rushing with 1,052 yards. He was the first 1,000-yard rusher for the Packers, also only the third in NFL history. Of course, that 1949 season was the last season for Curly Lambeau's coach. The Packers were only 2-10 and 10 that year. Um, he played for several years afterwards in which the Packers were also not very good, but he was somebody who was clearly looked upon as an absolute leader, both on the field and off the field, and his service is centrally to that. Um, in his career, 4,197 yards rushing. At the time, that was first rushing yards all time for the Packers. It is still fourth all time for the Packers. He had 47 total touchdown involvements, um, including uh, 16 passing and five receiving. As a safety, he had nine interceptions as well. Um, a sign of the respect that Packers players and, and Packers fans had for him, his number three was retired in 1952 as the second jersey that was retired by the Packers after Don Hudson's number 14. Um, he was in the Packers Pro Hall of Fame. He's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But he continued his connection with the Packers after his retirement. Um, he served um, various roles with the Packers. He became part of the Packers board in 1955. So just three years after his retirement, he was already part of the Packers board. He served on the Packers board until 1999. So he had a total of 55 years of service to the Green Bay Packers. Um, he was a part of the 1940s All-Decade team. He was also a color commentator for the Packers with Ray Scott during the Vince Lombardi era and ended up being very good friends with Vince Lombardi. Um, and he's buried in Alloway Catholic Cemetery. And I would say that this is something that, that we need to do on a future trip I make to Green Bay is to go to see some of those Packers grave sites in Alloway Catholic Cemetery. Um, but, but a player who clearly had his career impacted by his commitment to his country. Um, he, he lost two years in his prime after his best year in the NFL. He had only two years total as far as being an all pro. Um, but like Ted Williams in baseball, a man whose overall career numbers would have been better if he had not served in the army, but he clearly is a better man, a better leader and a better inspiration for his time serving. One other very notable NFL player and hall of famer who had military service is Roger Staubach, who played his college football at Navy Finished in 1964, was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys, but does not play for them until 1969 after serving his, his stint in the U.S. Navy. And certainly there's a lot of great things we could say about Roger Staubach as well. And we're only mentioning him because those Dallas Cowboys are coming to Green Bay this week. And it is a homecoming of sorts because the Dallas Cowboys current head coach, Mike McCarthy, was the head coach of the Green Bay Packers for Super Bowl 45. So it is uh, McCarthy's first game back uh, as a Dallas Cowboy coach or any coach uh, after a long tenure, obviously, with the Packers. Um, it's, you know, players that, that played for McCarthy. I know Aaron Rodgers had some really nice things to say about McCarthy today. Um, and, you know, he was a great coach. He, he was, you know, back in the day, back in the – the late aughts and the, and the teens, uh, he was our coach. He was the Green Bay coach. He was a guy from, from uh, kind of Philadelphia or the Pittsburgh area, you know, kind of a gruff, stout dude. Just he was all about football and uh, certainly Packer fans embraced him. He did have a great deal of success in Green Bay for many, many years. And uh, so I think, you know, I, I hope uh, and I assume that Packer fans will uh will treat him with the respect uh, that frankly he deserves. He, he did very well for this franchise. You know, he was fired a mid season or, you know, towards the end of season um, when he kind of lost the, the locker room, but um, you know, he's still, he's done well with Dallas. We talked about um, 
early this season. And I, I know that this came up with uh, a mutual friend of ours noting that, uh, you know, kind of talking a little crap about Dallas, you know, that maybe McCarthy would be gone by now. When in fact, he's very much <laughs> the coach of Dallas doing very well. Thank you very much. Um, got through the whole Dak Prescott injury and, uh, you know, he, he seems to be thriving there. You know, he, he works well, obviously with, uh, Jerry and, uh, Jerry's world in that whole situation and he's successful. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy for him in that aspect. I just hope that he doesn't have a good game this coming Sunday. Something that I just found out was, uh, this week was that he still maintains a house in green Bay, which makes sense. Oh, wow. Yeah, his wife is from the area. His daughters were born here. Uh, right. So they still maintain a house in Green Bay. So they have, for a homecoming for themselves, they actually have a place to stay, which is <laughs> pretty nice yeah. as well. But as far as, huh. as far as the game itself, Neil, what uh, what are you looking at? Well, I, first of all, uh, as far as Mike McCarthy is concerned, I think the most, uh, so he obviously won a Super Bowl for us and was a great regular season coach and, uh, you know, was involved in, in the does didn't catch it game um, that, that is featured here. Um, we've, we've had plenty of good memories. I, I think my biggest, you know, long term memory of Mike McCarthy is uh, how when the game mattered in the playoffs, he figured out a way to put his hands around his throat. And uh, I am hoping that Mike McCarthy is going to put his hands around his throat on Sunday. Um, he, he has a tendency to be a really good regular season coach when the chips are down. He and, you know, he's a he's an underdog as he was when when we had the Dak Prescott injury. That's when Mike McCarthy does his best work. I think working with a team that's really strong on defense is something that also plays to Mike McCarthy's strength. I am hoping that Mike McCarthy gets a little complacent as he is prone to do when he is in a position of being ahead of the game. Um, again, no, no hard feelings for, for Mike McCarthy, obviously way better than the previous two coaches we had in green Bay. Um, and, 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 you know, we have Super Bowl 45 because of Mike McCarthy. We have a Mike McCarthy way because of that. And it's a wholly, mm. wholly deserved Mike McCarthy way. Um, so what are we facing as far as Dallas team is concerned? So first of all, where are the Packers after that game in Detroit, where our offense really started to pick up a little bit and our defense was actually good. Um, so the Packers are uh, by DVOA 21st in the NFL. So they are in the bottom half and they're basically right in the middle on offense and on defense. Um, Jeff, the ass has our 30th um, special teams by DVOA. So our special seriously, teams they're still that well, shitty. We were up at 10th earlier this year. We've fallen down to 30th for special <laughs> teams DVOA. Wow. Now, there are a couple of things about the Packers that are encouraging statistics. We actually are number nine in the NFL in total yards, um, and we're number eight in the total number of plays. And so we've been able to do some things on offense, and it's just that we've not it, – it's like the Detroit game. We did a lot of things, and they never entirely came together. But I think it is something that clouds our three and six record. Uh, as fa Packers fans, we just look at that record, but our team is doing better overall than that three and six record. And um, well, I still think that Dallas obviously deserves to be the favorite in the game. Um, I think that we've got a chance. I don't think that this is something that is irretrievably bad as far as playing the Cowboys. I think that playing Mike McCarthy and the Cowboys is something good. It will be motivating for the team. Um, on the other hand, Dallas is really good. Their overall team rating by DVOA is number three. Their offense is 10th in the NFL by DVOA. Their defense is number one. And their special teams are number two by DVOA. This is a team that is really good. And specifically looking at their number one defense, they only allow 5.5 yards per attempt passing. They are really good at defending the pass. Um, they've taken seven interceptions, but more importantly, they have 33 sacks against opposing quarterbacks in this year. So um, their defense is really good against the pass and the, key that we're going to have to do is not get into those situations where Aaron Rodgers is going to have to wait for something developing downfield because that is exactly what the Dallas defense feasts upon. You know, that also points to the opportunity, right? What did we, what worked against Buffalo? Well, we're able to run the ball. And I think that that is where our key opportunity is in this game. Well, scoring is going to be important as we noted uh, previously, just kind of between us, so the Packers, it's been 30 years through since the Packers have scored this few points average 
through the first nine games of the year. So they're averaging 17.1 points per game. There was a guy by the name of Brett Favre back in 1992, 30 years ago, and it was his first season. So 30 years, that's a long time. And that's, I mean, this is like generationally shitty offense. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm concerned because, okay, now they have, they, they can't, they really sc- struggle to score points. The ass hats are the ass hats. The defense is suspect. And now they're going against this almost impenetrable defense. So, and they're at home. So the weather, you know, it's going to be cooler. It's certainly not going to be, you know, right now it's, it's in the sixties almost freakishly warm. Now it's going to be seasonal, right? It's going to be mid November, cooler weather, maybe, you know, so does that play to green Bay's advantage? Maybe does that play to the running games advantage? Hopefully. But I'm just I'm concerned that Aaron Rodgers is really going to take a beating if he doesn't. You know we're gonna we're gonna see these little short passes I think again because he's not going to have the time. And if they can't establish a running game, I think they've got a huge problem. I think running game, you know, is the key thing, Neil. Like you said, Buffalo it worked. Um, temperature wise, we're looking at a high temperature in Green Bay of 35 degrees. We aren't expecting snow. But this is a 325 kickoff. So an hour after kickoff is sunset. So it's going to be 35 degrees and cooling off quickly. And yeah, we have a a cold weather team, but we haven't had cold weather yet. So both teams, I think, are going to be affected by this. And I think that it, it is something that, yeah, we definitely have to see Green Bay really running the ball. One other thing that we haven't seen a lot of is, you know, the Packers being an underdog at home. The line on this game started out with Dallas favored by three. It ballooned up to five. It's Mm -hmm. at four and a half at the moment, but uh, nonetheless, you know, Dallas is favored in in this green Bay in November. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing though, that it going back to those offenses, right. As far as yards per play on offense, the Packers actually have a better number for yards per play on offense. It's not by much. It's a very small difference. The difference between these two teams is really the quality of the Dallas defense. And so it's going to be those things like getting us into a short field, maybe getting a couple of turnovers. We're going to have to do something that's going to relieve the pressure on our defense and give our offense some sort of advantages that we have not had for most of the year. Something like what Jair did against Detroit, seeing things along those lines, maybe let's recover a fumble for a change. That would be something that would be good. (laughs) Do something along those lines, because again, Dallas is only allowed 12 touchdowns in the entire year. They've got a really good defense. We've got to do something that puts our offense into good positions to score. But on the other hand, our defense, I feel reasonably good about because it's not been them charging down the field. You know, I certainly worry about Zeke and the rest of the running game, given how teams have done running against us. And certainly Mike McCarthy is going to recognize that. But we're, we're going to have to see. But I think there are at least opportunities for us to do well and to make our strengths play out. One last thought on the whole Packers-Cowboys long history that we have is that obeying the law of gravity is not a football move. And as you can see there, it was not a catch. So that's, that's Packers-Cowboys <laughs> history, but we have a lot more history to talk about. So it's time for Jeff to give us a bedtime story. So in keeping with this month's uh, salute to service and with veterans, so I looked back and um, was wondering how many Packers um, and, and how the Packers have have participated in uh, their service. So um, with a great deal of research done in, with Cliff Crystal's book, um, I was looking, uh, referenced 35 Packers while they were actively playing in Green Bay went into military service and about another 25 former players served in world war II. So that's 60 Packer players that served in world war II, either while they were actively playing for the Packers or either before or after. So um, w- only one of those players, uh, a gentleman by the name of Howard Smiley Johnson was a casualty in world war II. I want to give you a little bit of uh, history on him. It sounds like he was, really an amazing individual um and then touch a little bit about how other packer players were affected by world war ii so howard uh was he played three years at the university of georgia 
and he played for the Packers in 1940 and 41. He played in all the games. He didn't start most of them, but he did play. He was undersized um, as a guard back, even back in the day, but he was, um, he was a great, great player in terms of his uh, ferocity, his tenacity, and that served him very well um, in, in the military. So he voluntarily, so after playing for a couple of years for the Packers, he voluntarily, voluntarily signed up to be a Marine because he wanted action. Well, those, uh, those of you who are listening who might, might be Marines or, or are familiar with the Marines, he got exactly what he signed up for. So he was quickly promoted to 1st Lieutenant, 4th Marine Division. He was awarded a Silver Star, leading his battalion in the invasion of Saipan. And unfortunately, he was killed in action on February 19th, 1945, uh, on the first day of the Battle of Iwo Jima. And incidentally, there were two other NFL players who were killed in the Battle of Iwo Jima. He was uh, posthumously awarded another Silver Star for bravery. And so he was just an amazing, amazing, um, not only player in those who knew him in that short time he was in Green Bay, but also served his country with, with valor. Um, other Packer players who served during World War II, um, there was a gentleman by the name of Hal Van Every. He was the number one pick by the Packers in the 1940 draft. He was a pilot that was shot down during a bombing mission and held for over a year in a uh, prison gulag. And unfortunately, he did not play football ever again. Uh, Bob Fort or Forte fought for three years uh, with an army tank battalion in Europe. He came home. He played for the Packers for five years. And then he was called up again uh, to serve uh, during the Korean conflict as well. And finally, uh, Don Hudson, although he did not, I didn't find any record that he actually served. His brother did serve and unfortunately was killed in action in late August of 1943 and Don's father, Roy, or, or so it appears that when he received word that um, his son, Don's brother, was killed, that he suffered um, and died suddenly as well uh, after hearing of his son's death. So um, Don Hudson, this, the story goes, did, uh, did this was right before opening season, 1943. He did play in the games. He did was able to make it down uh, to Arkansas to the um, to the funerals uh, for his brother and his father, and then came back and and kept playing. So Don Hudson uh, was was a unique player, obviously in Packer history, and so that's that's how a little bit of how World War II affected him as well. Certainly, we have lots of friends, family members. Uh, and even hopefully some of our, our fans, your listeners and fans that have military service, we appreciate the service that you have given. We can't certainly list everybody at this time, uh, but we are again thankful for the NFL, Green Bay Packers, and their salute to service here in the month of November. Before we wrap up, you guys, any final words? I want to go back to the Detroit game and the fact that we had two first and goal opportunities and specifically we had that first and goal at the one yard line and we didn't give the ball to it should have been at the one centimeter line <laughs> and we didn't give the ball to Aaron Jones once um, Aaron Jones on the year has 600 yards rushing 5.6 yards per attempt he has one touchdown. A.J. Dillon has one rushing touchdown. Christian Watson has one rushing touchdown <laughs> in nine games the Packers have three rushing touchdowns. You wow. want to know how to get ourselves right? Let's get ourselves more than three rushing touchdowns the rest of the year. Go Pack Go. So I'm going to try some reverse psychology. Um, I'm going to say we're going to get our ass handed to us. <laughs> we're going to get blown out. I mean, this is going to be so a little bit of history looking back. So the Packers have actually had good success against Dallas over the last really decade plus. And they've usually won by double digits. Yeah, that's not going to happen this time. They're going to get their ass handed to them. Dallas is going to come in. They're going to impose their will on a stunned Lambeau Field crowd. There may be some boo birds. Um, and Mike McCarthy is going to have that Mike McCarthy shit-eating grin on his face. 
and he is going to leave Lambeau Field a victor. The other thing about this game is two months ago, it was the hardest ticket to get for Lambeau Field. Secondary market tickets were uh, very high. People who have, you know, their season tickets, they made they made money on this game. If they sold uh, early. Yeah, yeah, right now, I can tell you for a fact that there are a lot of face value tickets available uh, right now. And uh, it's possible that those prices could go down uh, by the time Sunday rolls around. And, and you combine the weather with poor play. <clears throat> so if you if you wanted to go to the Packers Dallas game and you don't have a ticket yet, uh, keep checking and you'll find someone who is probably going to try giving away some tickets this weekend. Yikes. Well, like I said, I hope we'll see if my reverse psychology works this week. I have no idea what to expect. We'll and see. That, that, that's where we are in the season, right? It's like, yeah. you know, different things are happening. We're seeing different positive elements of most of the games recently, but we need them all to come together. And, you know, the hope is that this is the week that they come together. Or we'll find ourselves quoting our friend Peter and saying, it just gets worse, doesn't it? <laughs> all right. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit subscribe. Make sure you leave a comment for us as well. It's all free. doesn't cost you anything. You can also find the GBC podcast at Green Bay Chat. That's all one word, Green Bay Chat. We are on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat as well as on Facebook at the GBC podcast, Green Bay Chat. And as always, may you fully appreciate the magnitude of your impending good fortune. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Good night.